morning, everybody. Um, I was so blessed to see the, the kids participating this morning. Um, especially blessed to see um, uh, them leading in prayer, you know. Uh, it's interesting that a big key to be, being able to have, fulfilling, have a, a fulfilling prayer life is believing that God loves you. And when I was watching uh, Bryce, I, I, I could see, wow, this kid, he knows that God loves him. Because it, love unlocks faith, you know, because we, we need to believe that God's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And clearly that young man does. And uh, um, anyways, I praise God for the, the children, children's ministry here. Um, will you open your Bibles up to 2 Timothy chapter 2? And we, we're looking at verses 13 and 26. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And we will be looking at verses 13 to 26. And as you turn there, I will pray. Father, we thank you that we can come to you in prayer. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you love us, Lord. I pray that you would reveal it to everyone in this room, Lord, that, that we would operate, Lord, especially for such a time as this, uh, on the base premise that you are sovereign and you are good and you love us, Lord. We can know that. And Lord, I, I pray, Lord, that um, that would be imparted um, as part of our ministry here. And Lord, as we worship you by looking into your word this morning, I pray, Lord, um, as this text says, I'd be a, a good uh, servant, rightly dividing the word of truth. And I pray that everything that's said would come right from you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Second Timothy chapter 2, beginning of verse 14, it says, Remind them of these things and charge them before God, not to quarrel about words, which, do, which does no good, but only ruins its hearers. Do your best to present yourself as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. But avoid irreverent babble, for, for it will lead people to more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some, but God's firm foundation stands, bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Now in a great house, there, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use and some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for use for, honor, for honorable use, set, set apart as holy, useful in the master's house, ready for every good work. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, and love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they only breed quarrels. And Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to everyone, able to teach, patient, patiently enduring evil, correcting opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of truth. They may come to their senses and escape the snare of, from, of the devil after being held captive to do his will. You know, as we... In, in a culture such as this, and in, in, in a particular um, season we're in as a church, I, as I read, studied this passage, I was thinking about the measure of our lives. Um, Clay Christensen, um, who's a professor at Harvard Business School, he wrote a book entitled, How Will You Measure Your Life? And, it, and it's influenced by his faith and, and, um, and also a, a severe illness that he went through. Um, he, he wrote this, he said, this past year I was diagnosed with cancer and I faced the possibility that my life would end sooner than I planned. Thankfully, it looks now as if I will be spared, but the experience has given me an important insight into my life. He concludes his article by saying, I have a pretty clear idea of how my ideas have generated enormous revenue for companies and, and how they have used my research. I know I've had a substantial impact. But as I confronted this disease, it's been interesting to see how unimportant that impact is to me now. I've concluded that the metric by which God will assess my life isn't dollars, but individual people. 
whose lives I've touched. That is the way it will work with all of us. Don't worry about the level of individual prominence you have achieved. Worry about the individuals that you have helped become better people. This is my final recommendation. Think about the metric which you will use, which you will, your life will be judged, and make a resolution to live every day so, so in that, at the end of your life, you will be judged as a success. I really think that that brings um, this passage into sharp focus for us, and, and specifically when it comes to us as a church. You know, Whispering Pines Church, our mission is to br- bring people closer to God one disciple at a time. How do we measure success on that mission? I think this passage in 2 Timothy chapter 2 may help us. How will we measure success? There's three things in this passage. And it's like one, you can think of it like that illustration of a three legged stool. I mean, if you, you can't, it can't stand without, with, without one of them. You take one away and, and it collapses. They're all crucially vital. If you, if you have all three of these things, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that you will know that, you, that we have achieved on our mission. And not, not only will we have achieved our mission, but these three things are traits of a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Three traits of being a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. First, a faithful disciple will be careful with his words and his teaching. A faithful disciple will be careful with his words and his teaching. A, a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ is someone who speaks God's truth. Look at verse 14. It says, Remind them of these things and charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins its hearers. So Paul starts off by saying, remind them of these things. You know, if you've ever had any doubt that we need to be reminded of, of truth, I hope that, that that's been settled for you once and for all. Remind them of these things. We need, we need reminded. Paul uses this phrase several times in his letters to Timothy. And what are these things? Well, it could be referring to what he, what he just talked about in the previous passage, about, about taking everything you've learned and passing it on. Or, or it could be talking about his, the, the entirety of, of his teaching that he's given Timothy. Either way, Timothy is not, is not free to make up his own content. He's only to, he's, he's to, to, to present, him, he's to speak sound doctrine. This is in verse 15. Do your best to present yourself to God as an approved worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Timothy is not free to, to make up his own content, he, but he's, he's be diligent, like all of us, rightly handling the word of God. Our jobs, whether, whether you're an elder, a pastor, or a Christian, is to study to show ourselves approved and to, and to rightly handle God's word. Do you know why I'm amazed? And I'm, I'm, our culture really proves an ex, uh, a real um, life apologetic for the gospel for me. You know, right, right behavior, right beliefs, right behavior follows right beliefs. Right beliefs and right behavior go hand in hand. There's no way around it. I mean, think about it. You know, ideas and beliefs have consequences. That's, that's why what we, what we preach and what we say is so, so important. I mean, think about it. Why did... Hitler killed million, millions and millions of people and wanted to take over the world. I'll tell you why. Because he believed what Charles Darwin believed. You know, that, that famous book, The Origin of Species, which the subtitle, by the way, is The Preservation of the Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. Now, as far as I know, I'm not an expert on the subject, but I don't, I don't believe that Darwin was, was in the eugenics. But he did believe that there was a more advanced race, and that just happened to be the white race, by the way. But he didn't, I don't think he was in a hurry to speed up the process. But if you know anything about history, Hitler, Lenin, and Stalin were deeply influenced by evolution. And they saw, it, they saw a clear application of it to genocide. But you know, the, the destructive Darwinian beliefs don't stop with evil dictators. You know, more than a million babies are aborted in the United States every year. Now, now God shows grace on abortion, and we, we, and we need to surround people that are thinking about making that decision. But for me, I've always, when, especially when I was a young Christian, I used to be puzzled. How can anybody even debate this subject, really? I mean, how could people believe this? 
How, I mean, and how did the, the country become so abortion happy? I'll tell you about how, because we've dehumanized human life. I would make the argument that if you think that a life begins at conception and, and, and it possesses a soul right from the time it's conceived, you'd have a hard time aborting. But if you think it's a tissue or a tumor, something like that, it might not be as, as difficult to make the decision. Now, that everyone who holds these beliefs doesn't get abortions, but they're all in the same camp. Wrong behavior brings about wrong beliefs. The natural, and, and, and you know, the natural, uh, if, you, if you do the math, over 1.3 billion uh, babies have been aborted since 1980. And I'm not preaching about abortion and genocide, just trying to make the point that behavior follows your, follows your beliefs. 1.3 billion, I don't know for sure, but that has to be close to the population of the whole Western Hemisphere. And as far as I can see, that's the biggest genocide in history. Why isn't it seen as that? Because, because what you believe, by and large, determines how you behave. And even though what, how we, what we believe determines what, how we behave, one of the best ways to understand what, what we believe is not starting with your beliefs, but starting with your behavior. If you, if you think you're a, you believe in being generous and, and you're a generous person, watch your behavior. Watch how you spend your time and how you use your talents. If you don't share them with other people and, and try to bless the, the world or the community, then the fact is, is your behavior has shown that you don't believe in being generous. Therefore, our, our beliefs determine our behavior, but our behavior also exposes our true beliefs. Now, I think in light of this, we need to think about how important it is, what we teach and what we say. Sound doctrine, everything we say is, is so important. I mean, and Paul goes on to give consequences for, for bad teaching, for, for false teaching. He says, he says, those who don't hold, hold, hold to, to true teaching, who hold to false teaching, he says it results in consequences. In verse 16, ungodliness, false teaching spreads like gangrene. It, it, it severs people from the truth, and it upsets the faith of some, he says in verse 17. Now, it, it, he, he says, that false teaching spreads like gangrene, and I think of all the four metaphors, that's the most graphic for me, right? Think about that. And it's really hit me lately in our culture because I can't believe how people can believe just outright nonsense and lies. I, 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 it just puzzles me. And, but he says false teaching is like gangrene, and I can see how, how, how that's true. Gangrene is dead tissue. If it's not cut out and stopped, it'll continue to spread until you have to lose a limb. I heard a, a friend tell a story once of when he, he said when he was a kid, he fell out of a tree. His friend fell out of a tree, broke his arm. By the time someone got there to help him, it started getting gangrene already, and he ended up losing his arm. But that's the way it is with false teaching. Once it, once it, once it sets hold of the body, unless it's, it's extreme, extreme measures are taken to root it out, it could, it'll continue to spread it, even, even to kill. And you know, in the first century, the, the first century writer couldn't have used a better analogy than, than this, a better picture than this. Because we are the body of Christ. And when false teaching takes hold of the body, unless it's stopped, radically stopped, it'll spread. And, could even, and it could even threaten the life of, of the church. And, and I would even venture to, to, to say that perhaps an argument can be made that any church that's ever died has succumbed to some form of false teaching. Because you see the results of it, how, what, all, the, all the ramifications of it, what, what happened. And, and, but as potentially as false teaching is, Paul also warns us to avoid certain topics. He also says, he says um, to, to, avoid, to avoid disputing over words. You know, when I was in seminary, you know, people love to, dis to argue over words. I know, I know people have spent lots of money, other people's money, arguing over words. I remember when I was in seminary class, and, and, and when I was, was passionate full-time and I'm in a very rigorous program, and, and this is not a right response from me, I confess, and I confess it to the Lord. But I spent classes where an hour people were arguing over one little word, a preposition. And I, I, a student would raise their hand. Never, you know, as far as I know, I don't know if he's ever served in, in a church. And say, hey, um, professor, I heard a pastor use this word, and they're arguing about the, the tenses of it. I'm thinking, hey, how are you going to make it in ministry? Are you just arguing over words? I mean, just silly things. And he, and he says, and he says also to, to avoid uh, foolish controversies. He says pursue sound doctrine and avoid foolish controversies. That's the other side of pursuing sound doctrine is avoiding 
um, certain things. And some of, the, some of the descriptions that he gives here shows what happens when people spend time on, on foolish arguments. He said it only leads to more quarrels. He says it, it breeds more quarrels, which the word breed means to give birth to. The statement is similar to what Paul has already said in 1 Timothy chapter 6. About, uh, he, he described a certain kind of person who is like this. He said he is puffed up, one who, who loves quarrels and likes to argue. He's puffed up with conceit, understands nothing. And he, he is an unhealthy crave, craving for controversy and for quarrels about words. And it, it does nothing but produces envy, dissension, slander, and evil suspicions. There's a time to confront controversy and there's a time not to confront controversy. One example of when to confront controversy is, is what Paul says here. He's, he's told Timothy plenty of times to, to, to confront people. But confront the right things. Don't argue over words and don't argue over, over silly things. But here, he, here he's saying that, that, that these, two, these two gentlemen have, have been telling people that the resurrection already happened. And if, and if, if you want to do some deep thinking, it, which doesn't take, you don't have to get very deep. If you, if you get, think the resurrection's already happened, then it pretty much undercuts all of Christianity. That's, an argue, that's a controversy that we should take on. But the challenge is to know which ones to confront and which ones to avoid. You know, I've, um, so many churches have so many um, uh, stupid arguments is what's, what the word is, exact word that some of these translations use. There's actually a website for stupid arguments in, in, in the church. And, and just a couple of them. One is there's a 45-minute argument over what type of filing cabinet to purchase. A brown, black or brown, two, two drawers or three drawers. Arguments in business meetings over whether to purchase a weed whacker. And it took two hours to resolve that one. People, some people don't like the term potluck, and they want they, and an argument ensued. Some people left the church because coffee was changed. I mean, these are silly arguments, and, and they could definitely be more sophisticated than that. But we should avoid arguing about stupid things that does no profit to anybody. A faithful disciple of Jesus Christ is careful with his words and his teaching. That's the first leg of the stool, and it's an important one. Other things are important, but this one is crucial. Don't spread gangrene throughout the body of Christ. Study to show yourself approved. Give, give everything you have to, 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 to God's word and, and knowing truth. When you see something in our culture, know how, know how, the, how the gospel applies to it and, and let it prove the, the worth of the gospel. And that's how you measure a faithful, that's how you measure a faithful disciple, by, by their words and their teaching. That's one way. Work hard as a teacher. Second, a faithful disciple will, set, will be set apart for Jesus Christ. A faithful disciple will be set apart for Jesus Christ. That's a word for holiness. Some people think holiness is a scary word, right? But it's not. It's, it's a place. That's where, that's, where, that's, where, that's where God is. And God's looking for pure and holy vessels to carry a pure and holy gospel. He write, Paul writes in verse 22, So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. It's not just our teaching that matters. It's our lives that matter. Paul, think, Paul thinks about two categories. The, the, the valuable, he uses the household illustration. The valuable stuff made of gold, gold and silver that you use for special occasions. And the less honorable stuff made out of cheaper material. And, he's, and he, he wants Timothy, he's encouraging Timothy to stay in the first category, to be, to be an instrument, be a vessel that's used for noble purposes. Do you know this? This is just talking. This is talking about discipleship and sanctification. It's the direction. It's the direction we're going, and it's not that we. This isn't a legalistic thing. It's just we're progressively being made more and more into the likeness of Jesus Christ, and it, and it shows that we're not comfortable with living in sin. If you're comfortable with sin, then then you should really check yourself before the Lord. I mean, don't you want to be a vessel used for noble purposes? You know, last week. Uh, was it last week, I guess, or two weeks ago? Tom Brady won the NFC Championship game with, the, with his team, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and he's on his way to his 10th Super Bowl. I mean, how many Super Bowls have we had? That has to be a significant fraction of them, right? 10. And, you know, as I think about that, I, and I, I'm a Steeler fan, and they, the Pittsburgh Steelers drafted a quarterback by the name of Ben Roethlisberger in, 19, in 2005. And I say this, through the lens of someone who's very talented, 
this talent that people can be can get really lazy because of their, their gift, you know. But in his first year, first couple of years, he wrecked on a motorcycle, one of the fastest motorcycles in the world, driving through Pittsburgh without a helmet, smashed his face on the concrete. He had a lot, lots of other things made to do. But but if I would, if I need to look at a guy like Tom Brady, clearly he's doing something that 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 other quarterbacks aren't doing. You could tell his other quarterbacks, and they say. Why should I have to do that? Why should I not eat this or not eat that? Or why? You know, give my whole life for this. You don't, you don't have to. I mean, Tom would have probably made it to a couple of Super Bowls, you know. But he, he wants to be a, a, a vessel used for good purposes on, on his team. And don't you want to be like that for the Lord? How, what do you, what kind of, what are you, we have to ask ourselves what we're comfortable with. Don't you want more of God? Holiness is a place. That's where God is. So there's more we can enjoy. God doesn't change. But sometimes we're, we're put ourselves in positions where we can't hear him. And, I, and I, I like to be able to, to enjoy God, especially during a time like this. How do we maintain ourselves? It says, a vessel, as a vessel used for honorable use, set apart in the master's house for every good purpose. One, we watch our lives. We flee, it says, we need to flee and pursue. We need to drop one thing and pursue something else. We need to flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. You know, when we hear flee youthful passions, we may think, well, that's not for me, right? Because we, we, we associate it with sexual desire, but, but that's not what Paul's referring to here. In fact, most scholars agree that he's referring to a list of things like impatience, harshness, the love for debate, self-assertion, self-indulgence, self -in selfish ambition, stubbornness, arrogance, and more. John Stott writes, he says, but we are to recognize sin as something that's dangerous to the soul. We are not to come to terms with it or even negotiate with it. We are not to linger in its presence like Lot at Sodom. On the contrary, we are to get as far away from it as we possibly can, as quickly as we can. I mean, how many of you husbands have the fight or flight with your wife, right? You just flight, you just want to, hey, I don't want to just, just drop it. This is the time where you need to choose flight. You need to flee, run away. Just like, just like Joseph with Potiphar's wife, just, he left his coat there. But on the other hand, pursue holiness. Pursue holiness. Re replace a bad habit with a good one. Paul lists four positive qualities that we're supposed to pursue. Righteousness, faith, love, and peace. Run away from immature behavior. Run toward holiness. Run to the, char the characteristics of a pure heart. You know, our lives matter. They matter a lot. John Wesley said, Give me 100 men who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God, and I will shake the world. How do we measure achieving on, on mission here at Whispering Pines? How do we measure faithful disciples? We measure them by their, their teaching, teaching that proves itself in, in its lifestyle. And, and faithful disciples are those who are learning, in the process of learning to run away from their sins and run toward purity of heart. And none of us have arrived. This is ongoing pursuit. And remember, the number one sign that gospel ministry is taking effect in your life is an awakening of your need for it. So if you feel, if you feel convicted about that, it's good news for you. That means the gospel is, is working in your life. Salvation is free, but you have to fight for your character. And character always overshadows talent. And there's one more measure of a faithful disciple. That's number three. Faithful, a faithful disciple will be a servant of Jesus Christ. A faithful disciple will be a servant of Jesus Christ. He'll be someone who prays earnestly for those who are lost or in, or in the devil's grip. And then Paul concludes in verses 24 to 26. He says, The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone. Able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness, God, that God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. You know, this is, when I read that, when Paul talks about kindness and gentleness, um, I, I, I can't help but to think about Stephen. I, I often wonder how much Paul's memories of Stephen influenced his life and ministry. And I wonder, and I can't help but to wonder if he, Paul had him in mind here. 
Remember, Paul held the, the coats for the people who stoned Stephen, and in, 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 in a lot of in a major way, he was part of the people who, who killed him. And I, I can't help but think he couldn't get the image of Stephen's gentle manner out of his mind. I think it was just in, in, engraved and burned onto his soul. You remember the passage in Acts 7, verse 59, it says, And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had, when he had said this, he fell asleep. Even Stephen's death was gentle. He didn't die in some terrible agony. He says he fell asleep. Now, I can't prove that's what Paul was thinking. The script Bible doesn't tell us. But I, can't, but I, but I suspect that Stephen's, Stephen's example is something that Paul never forgot. When, he, when he's marching, he, he traveled 14, over 14,000 miles on foot in all his mission trips. I can't help but, but to think that that image of, of Stephen and God's grace on him was, was on his mind, branded on, his, on him in terms of his suffering and, and, and his gentleness. People who, oppose, you know, people who oppose the truth of God should not be scolded in the submission. They need to be gently instructed. I mean, there's two parts to this according to these verses, our part and the Lord's part. On our part, it says the, Lord, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, must be kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness, you know, it's, it's not just what you say, but it's how you say it. Remember, Paul's, Paul took it, the attitude of his orthodoxy as important as the orthodoxy itself. He said, Gen be gentle, kind, patient. Never be quarrelsome. You know, I, I've never in my lifetime seen anyone who was, who was convinced that they needed to follow Jesus Christ because they were argued in the submission. Have any of you? <laughs> that, doesn't, that doesn't do anything. Well, I, I think we, 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 we sometimes we beat people over the head and God loves you. No, confess that God loves you and you're beating them over the head with the Ten Commandments or, or whatever. You're talking to people who are totally unregenerated. People who have no idea that God loves them. And you need to, we, we need to be agents of God's love. Well, that's our part, being kind, patient, and never quarrelsome. But notice God is a part too. See, I think sometimes the reason we come out with guns blazing is because we, we think we get the, our roles mixed up. You know, we don't have to try to offend anybody. The gospel is offensive enough. It surely is. It's very exclusive. I mean, look, look, at, it says, uh, the, look at the difference with, with God's roles. It says that God may perhaps grant them repentance, lead them to a knowledge of the truth, that he may lead them to come to their senses, and that he will help them escape the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Do you ever think that we try to do something that uh, they, only God himself can do. We, people aren't receiving it, so we think we didn't say it loud enough, right? Didn't yell loud enough. We didn't repeat it enough. We didn't have them read the right thing. But our problem is we get the roles mixed up. We want the other person to repent, so we push harder. We want them to come to a knowledge of truth, so we shoot them, we shoot them down. This is an arena. An arena, only God can grant repentance. Only hope the Holy Spirit can lead someone to a revelation of knowledge of the truth. That's important. We need, we need, to, we need to, to, to be agents of God's love. You know, judgment starts within the house of the Lord, right? I mean, judgment starts in here. Law, uh, it's, the, it's the hypocrites of the Lord that, that, that we need to, to, to confront over appropriate things, not foolish things. Here at Whispering Pines, our mission is bringing people closer to God one disciple at a time. How do we measure success on that mission? How do you measure a faithful disciple? A faithful disciple is known by their words and their teaching. They're known by their godly character and by a servant's heart. He or she is a person who speaks God's truth, lives out God's nature, and prays earnestly for those who have fallen prey and are lost in the devil's trap. And that's a pretty good list. That's one that we, we can use as a template. Of a friend of mine once was saying about uh, telling a story of, of him appearing before a pastor's search committee. They asked him how he would measure success in the church if he came to the church. Now, maybe you'd think he'd say something like attendance, growth, conversions, and things like that, but he didn't. He said, he said five things. He said, one, one, 
I can, I'll be successful if Jesus says to me, well done, good and faithful servant. Two, if I have the best possible marriage. Three, if my children are following Jesus and the knowledge that, he, that they have the, the best father possible. Number four, a good bunch of friends. Number five, the knowledge that, 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 that I have equipped the team to do the work of the ministry. And those are the things. The approval of Jesus, loving others and building the people. Those are the measures by which we can know at Whispering Pines Church whether we are achieving on our mission. Faithful disciples are known by accolades, not known by popularity or prominence. A disciple is one who speaks God's truth, lives out his nature, and prays earnestly because he cares about people who are lost in the devil's trap. At the beginning, I mentioned a quote from, from Clay Christensen's lecture. He says, he says, don't worry about the level of an individual promise that you achieved. Worry about the individual's that you have helped become better people. That's my recommendation. Think about the metric by which your life, your ministry will be judged and then make a resolution to live every day, make decisions for, so, so that in the end, your life and your ministry will be judged a success. Let's pray. Father, I pray, Lord, that every person here, Lord, gets that being comes before behavior. Lord, I, I pray that we would, we would get that in the deepest parts of our soul, Lord. And, and your word's written that way. You, spend, you go through great lengths through your Holy Spirit telling us who we are in, in Jesus Christ and how much you love us before you tell us to do anything. And I pray, Lord, that we'd get that, Lord. And, and for those who don't know you, that Lord, the, the first thing, the first step for them is, is, is believing in the one whom you've sent, Lord. That's, that's the work of God, Lord, is believing in the one whom you sent, Jesus Christ, Lord. And, and Lord, and then being, being baptized in, in by, by your spirit, Lord, and have, being one with Christ, Lord, and Christ in us and, and us in him, Lord. And, and Lord, I, I pray we live um, our lives, Lord, and behave out of the implications of um, everything that you say about us, Lord, that our lives are in our are in Christ, Lord, and how much you love us and care for us, Lord. And I pray that just like um, little Bryce, Lord, that we would approach you, Lord, and joyfully because we just know that we know that we know that you're good and you really love us, Lord. And, and Lord, I pray, Lord, that we would want to be uh, vessels that are used for good, noble purposes, Lord, not ones that are thrown out with sewage, Lord. And, and Lord, I, I pray, Lord, that you would, um, Lord, help us, Lord, to uh, be your witnesses, Lord, and be good servants, Lord, and we would care about the lost, Lord, and we do whatever we can, Lord, short of sinning, to see people want to you, Lord, and we love people, Lord, and, and impart your love. In Jesus' name, amen.